So preparation, they have to be retrained. Teachers have to be retrained, you're saying? Yes. A and they, ha they have to wrap their heads around that you are going to trust them. It occurs to me that you know, what we have now is this, we, we used to have a system of trust when smart women couldn't get any other job. We trusted teachers and we moved all the way over to verify and we don't trust them at all. We need to get back to Reagan, trust and verify. But do you have to, you'd have to convince teachers that you trust them? I mean, <laughs> Jill? I mean, what, when, when you don't ask people to think about the work that they're doing, when you expect that it's a transaction, um, you don't get a good engaged um, process. Mm -hmm. So if teachers don't believe that they have room to really shape and, and drive the work that's happening in their classrooms, if it's all something that's coming from above them, mm -hmm. even if it's a good something, mm -hmm. you, you get a mix of resistance and, and kind of check the box types of compliance. And so part of the challenge here is to start to get teachers to intellectually engage in the challenge that they're facing with their students, mm -hmm. and in turn to get kids to intellectually engage and start to use their minds. Because kids and teachers in schools that are struggling, when you walk in the door, the way you know that it's a struggling school is everyone's bored. No one is engaged in what's going on. They're just going through the motions. And there's this fuzzy feeling, and maybe a couple kids who are really sure sort of overachievers who are trying to break through. And so trying to change that culture means giving some really substantive work for people to engage in. Do you find that, that veteran teachers uh, say, oh, well, here comes another reform, and I kept my head down last time, I'll just keep my head down this time? I, I would say that every time there's a new shift, there's a risk of that cynicism, yeah. and that part of the opportunity here, if districts, state level folks, principals can get moving mm -hmm. now, is to take this time over this next three years as this is being mm -hmm. developed and actually build capacity in a real deep way as opposed to waiting till 2014 to start. Other barriers? Huh? Just, I, mean, I think you referenced trust as an important um, uh, need for this work to, to succeed. Uh, you also referenced the, the importance of not seeing this work as uh, additive. We can't simply add more responsibilities to teachers. It has to be part of uh, a core district or network mission, an organizing principle for what teaching and learning looks like in schools and classrooms. So uh, embracing it in a holistic and systemic way uh, is critical. Uh, but also, let me add one more, reducing the load uh, of doing this work, making it easier to do ambitious work. But, but you already said it, Bob said it's harder. It is hard, and I think Bob's on the road to help making it easier with, with the tools that they're testing, with the ways that they're, they're, they're using technology to, to um, collaborate uh, more efficiently and effectively than they do now. And I would add, we need better ways of, of scoring student work so that a teacher isn't left with you know, 100 papers a day or a week or whatever to do. So we need to, to, to get smarter on technology on a lot of fronts. Well, barriers? Barriers. Um, we believe in order to do this work, you need vision as leaders. You need vision and courage. And I think evidence of the numbers of people that are here and other places we're going, there's a lot of vision that things need to change. The barrier, I think, is we all need to have the courage to do it. So you, are you saying there may be leadership in this room, but around the country there is not the vision? I what think there saying? is the vision, but there's not the courage. And so why is courage required? Because you're going to have, it's hard, and you're going to have to shift, and you're going to have to change practice, and you're going to have to change structures, and you're going to have to change your resources. But it's, it's what needs to be done for our kids. And so, and we wait for it to come from the larger policy place, right. where there's plenty of places within our own schools and our districts where you have an example in New York City where they're making the shift now. They're not, they're not waiting for the state. And Envision Schools is trying to do it at a small level with four schools. There's superintendents and districts across the country that are starting to move this way, not waiting for state or national sure. policy. And so that's when I say it's courage. And there's another piece of the courage, is the courage, courage to persist when innovation doesn't work right away. It's, not, it's meant to fail. I mean, and, to, and we're supposed to learn from that failure, and that's what 
because we're a charter management organization, we've had the ability for the last nine years to fail and to persist in our theory of action so that now we can start sharing what's worked. But there was plenty of stuff that didn't work. And you have to have the courage to try it, and you have to have the courage to fail because you'll, and, and to keep that cycle of inquiry going. So that's why I think some of our change is, is if we know what the change needs to be, we're just not doing it. If, if we do this, who, and I see a hand up, you have to come to the mic if you wish to ask a question, because apparently this is being recorded. <laughs> come on up here. Is there a mic there? No, no, because they want to record it, because oh. oh, apparently it's going to uh, uh, CIA or someplace. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but if, if bef while he's coming up there, if you do this, if you do this, who loses? Who benefits from the current system that we all think is mediocre? But if you do this, who, who, who suffers? Testing companies? What? Who? Jail? It's, it's the right question. I, I think it, the answer is more complicated. I think the way we got into this situation was through um, a complex interaction between federal laws, mm -hmm. state laws, and districts where people were generally well-intentioned and constructed a system that was failing all of us. And mm -hmm. so I think that there will be folks that can adapt to these changes and aren't winners in that context, but I don't think it's as simple as saying the testing companies are going to be angry. The publishers are going to be angry. So your, your name and your question. Uh, Rene DeRaza with All In Strategies out of Oakland. Uh, one qu quick question is, how do you do this? Uh, and do you have to disrupt the teacher union structures or the evaluation systems of personnel? How do you, how do you deal with the in-place regulatory framework? And do you have to disrupt that? Or can this be done? without essentially overturning uh, the, those major regulatory pillars? Great question. So I think that depends on the regulatory structure that you're embedded in. If, if there is space for um, professional learning to occur in schools and there's space for folks to work with teachers to change their practice, this is actually an area where there's interesting opportunities collab to collaborate with unions. Um, the national unions have been largely very supportive thus far of this work and are interested in this because it provides a set of resources for teachers that are often absent right now. I think broadly speaking, if principals don't have enough authority to leverage uh, supervision over the staff that they support, that makes it very difficult when there's a group of folks that don't want to engage. And so that broad challenge exists in many different types of configurations and does need to be pushed on in parallel. Um, yeah, actually, yeah. I'd like to add to uh, uh, Shale's comment. Uh, one of the things that's happening in New York City um, that I actually believe is a, is a, br a brilliant stroke. We're not saying uh, to every teacher uh, and every family in New York City that everything has to change. Um, what Every teacher in, uh, in the system, K-12, in New York City, uh, has to this year uh, either use an assessment uh, coming down from that assessment library that uh, Shale talked about, implement that in their classroom, give it a try, take one, try that. Or they could build their own assessment based on uh, their assignments in the classroom so that they actually have an opportunity to experience But they still have to do like. the regular stuff, which yes. is the thrust but they of have question. to do it one time in the year, at a minimum. Yeah. And, one and time in the year, they have to give it a, a try. And, Bob, and Bob's triangle, one was no, uh, which was K-N-O-W, which meant passing the state, the regular test. And you said you guys were doing fine. Question with your name first, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Tom Malarkey with the National Equity Project formerly the Bay Area Coalition for Equitable Schools. Um, it's a question through the lens of equity, and uh, allow me to play devil's advocate for a moment. Um, it seems that there's not anything that will automatically result in this kind of change in assessment in terms of helping regular public schools and districts close the achievement gap. That is, this won't automatically lead necessarily to the kind of teaching and learning that will 
uh, bring students who are multiple grade levels behind, say, up to grade level to even get in the ball game of being able to do this kind of work. And again, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Um, I think it's very powerful to have some demonstration proof, like at Envision. I think it sim functions in a similar way as to the way Central Park East used to back in the day. Um, and so what needs to be in place for this actually not to reproduce the achievement gap in some new ways? Great question. Thank you. Uh, let, me, let me take a, a, a start at that. Um, first of all, thank you for raising such an important question. Um, First of all, I think from, the, uh, from our foundation's perspective, uh, we have to do a couple things at once. So my description today of our investment in teacher supports for literacy and math tools uh, is one way of improving uh, classroom instruction or focused on investments that help to improve classroom instruction. Simultaneously, we have a set of investments uh, which we call student supports. So what are the ways which we can go direct to student with tools that will help them narrow that gap outside of the context of their classroom or allow them to engage more meaningfully in classrooms that are organized like this. So we can't um, only invest in classroom level uh, efforts, such as the ones we've talked about today, without thinking about the impact on the achievement gap and how to ensure uh, the well-intentioned ideas being presented here don't increase them inadvertently. It seems to me that the, the thrust of his question has less to do with an achievement gap than with an expectations gap. Because if you decide you're going to have performance assessments, teachers are going to, in their heads anyway, or maybe officially assess. And you say, well, John's capable of this, but Ray's capable of this. And you are perhaps uh, designing tasks or working out tasks that expect, have a different set of expectations for my performance versus his performance. Is that an issue? I think that the goal here is to create a set of tasks that everyone can access and to design curriculum that allows multiple entry points for kids at different levels to meet the standard. And it's not going to, there's no silver bullet in education. There never has been, there's never going to be. It's lots of small solutions. So this is one of the biggest barriers that exists to producing a quality education is the current summative assessments and the teaching practice that they inspire. By changing those assessments and opening up the door for a different kind of teaching practice, you do not guarantee student achievement, but you create a space for work that is deeper and more engaging with kids. And so where we lose a lot of our kids is because we're deadening the learning experience day after day, and they disconnect. And so the opportunity to connect kids into their learning creates an opportunity to close the achievement gap but it doesn't happen absent good teachers, strong principals, a well thought out structure that is supporting their work, good instructional supports um, for those practitioners. And so a lot of different things have to be in place to make it actually which, which, change the outcome. Which seems to me though you would need some way of monitoring to make sure your expectations were high. Otherwise you, you know, that gap, about. Well, that's in, in our system, and we in raised and taking it in Ohio. Is then if you're using a common scoring guide or rubric, then you've set the bar. So each teacher to the verify part, you can use student work from various teachers and then measure it against the same bar. Mm -hmm. And teachers that aren't getting kids to that bar, then we need to intervene and work to get them up. So it's not like we're just it's trust but verify. I think the other thing that we believe is that. The achievement gap is really important. The opportunity gap is even more important. And so we try to map our system back, and I think the, the good, a lot of the good work going on is mapping back from college and career success. And what does that mean? And what do you have to do to get prepared so when you graduate, you're ready for the next step? So I always wonder, like, we could close the achievement gap as measured by a state test, but have no more kids graduate from college than, uh, and change their economic outcomes and we, we wouldn't find that achievement gap closed on a, get, a, a test as a success. Yeah, fair point. One last question, and then we move to our next activity. Your name and question. Ed Hartle, Stanford. Uh, we've tried this theory of action before, that the right kinds of assessments would lead curriculum and instruction in the right direction. We had the California Learning Assessment System in California. We had the New Standards Project nationally. There have been other efforts. Uh, one problem that these systems, one thing that caused those past efforts to founder was 
the expectation on the part of the larger public that schools are going to teach kids certain things. And a lot of what schools are going to do is equip students with large numbers of facts and procedures. There are a lot of people in the country who've gone through school and think they understand. Uh, I need your question. How schooling is supposed to work. What's different this time? And how do you get people around the problem of the things that have to be undone to make room for the new things? Yeah. Great question. Thanks. I think that we're in a, in a historical moment where things are shifting. People have seen one of the weaknesses that comes from a very reductionist assessment and curriculum. And what I'm seeing, at least in New York, is a demand from parents for something different. And at the same time, I think we have an obligation to engage very actively with our parents and the broader public about why this is different. And, in the Common Core Standards, if you had asked me three years ago or 10 years ago, is every state in the country except for Texas and Alaska going to sign on to the same set of standards, I would have laughed. But it's happened. And that's powerful, and it's a shift. And it's shifted in the context of an accountability system that also exists that is going to hold folks accountable to those standards. When you combine those two with quality assessments, you've got a shot. And, and, and when, Ash? Yeah, I, I would just say, Ed, I think one big difference, the, the moment you referenced sort of that mid-90s was at the front end of globalization, but it was really was kind of pre-globalization. And, and here we are today seeing countries race past the U.S. on the international comparisons. And when we, we bring out uh, what other countries are doing, as Linda did to kick this off, we see a whole different way of thinking about teaching, learning, and assessment. And so I think that global recognition uh, could drive a different conversation this time around. And just uh, before I ask you to applaud, there's one other <laughs> incredible possibility here. These assessments have the capacity to get out there and be seen by the 80% of households that do not, does not have children, do not have children in the public schools. The 80 is, this can energize that 80% about the amazing things that are happening in school, because these things you can show. This is not some score on a test. So I mean, that, in a way, that maybe needs to be part of what's going on. It's not just the parents, it's the home. I think that you all should give a, a, a round of applause for all four, because Bob made up, well, no, 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 no. Well, well, Bob made up for going over with some very good answers to questions. <laughs> so you do not have to applaud for just three, so please applaud for all four. Thank you very much.